Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I'm going to walk you through a process of valuing Zim stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Let's get started with the model. This is a small cap company, 1.2 billion market cap, they're trading at 964 a share and they have 120 million shares outstanding. I actually set up the Excel file on Wednesday a few days ago and they were trading in the sevens. So I had to redo my Excel file. The stock went up like 25-30% in a couple of days. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. They generate a lot of free cash flow and it's grown quite a bit, 800 million to almost 5 billion. Now it's 6.5 billion. That's why they were paying such huge dividends their first few years and the stock went through the roof. It has really crashed lately. We'll look at their stock price in a little bit. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that also grows a lot, 10x, half a billion to nearly 6 billion. Revenue is a sales for the company and that's grown a lot as well. 4 billion up to 14 billion. Massive, massive growth with this company. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated the terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 4.3 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $4.4 billion. We divide that by 120 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $37. They're trading at $10, so they're trading at a 74% discount. It's a really strong buy according to the model. My regular model had them trading over $200 a share. But when my valuation is so far off from where they're trading, I tried to make it the most stressful scenario as possible. I gave them a whack of 20%. The average whack is 10%. The higher the whack, the lower the valuation. And I cut their future free cash flow estimates to back to 2020 levels. Even with all these stresses, the stock is 74% undervalued. So unless you think the company is going to go bankrupt, they're a screaming buy. There are 35 companies in the same industry as Zim. And if they have a number in red, they're worse than the median. If they have a number in blue, they're better. They don't spend that much in CapEx, 67 million equal to the median. Capital Product Partner spends the most, 570 million. When a company in this industry buys a vessel, that's a CapEx spend. And they carry that on their balance sheet and depreciate it over their useful life. Maybe they're not buying as many vessels as some of these other companies. Maybe they bought vessels in the past and they don't need any more. Or maybe they have some other situation where they don't actually buy the vessel outright. Or maybe they buy it with another company so they don't spend as much. There's lots of different scenarios to buying an expensive asset like a vessel. It's like buying an aircraft. Some of these vessels can cost in excess of $100 million. But if you get a used one that doesn't have as much capacity, you can get as low as a few million. They are a bit leveraged. Their debt to equity ratio is 1.8. So for every dollar of equity, they have $1.80 of debt. They used to pay a hefty dividend, but they cut it. Diana pays a 21% dividend. The median in the industry is 7%. The average is 6%. Star bulk is 12.5%. Doesn't look like Kirby pays a dividend. They generate more free cash flow than every other company in the industry combined. But the market is forward thinking. And the market is saying they're not going to be generating much free cash flow in the future. That's why the stock price is coming down. They rank 7th in market cap. Kirby is the biggest at $4.6 billion. They have amazing price multiples, the best of any company in this industry. They have the best PE, price to free cash flow and price to sales. And most companies in this industry have a really good price to book because they have lots of assets on their balance sheet, the vessels. Right before a company goes bankrupt, their price multiples are the most attractive, 0.1 and 0.2. So the market is indicating they may go bankrupt. I'm not sure if that's the case. We'll keep moving forward with the video and see if we can uncover more. They generate more revenue than any company in this industry, about as much revenue as the other 34 companies combined, and we can't look at their five-year annual revenue growth rate. They haven't been trading that long. They've been in business many decades, 
but they haven't been trading publicly for five years. Let me explain to you how I view the shipping industry and why prices are so volatile. It's because the supply of ships in the market is highly correlated to the profitability of the shipping companies. The cost to maintain a ship is fairly fixed, but it is dependent on the age of the ship. So you pretty much know your costs to maintain a ship. If it's an older ship, it'll be a little more than a newer ship, but it's a pretty tight range on your expenses. The revenue each ship receives can vary a lot depending on the number of ships in the entire market. There's always going to be demand by companies looking to transport products across the ocean. To transport items within any country or within landlocked countries is usually by railroad. That's the most efficient way to do it. For example, if you're transporting cargo from Africa to the U.S. by plane, it's way too expensive because you can't fit that much product on a plane. So shipping by vessels is really the only viable option when transporting across an ocean. So when the number of ships in the market falls, then the remaining ships are able to charge more per delivery. When a shipping company makes a lot of money, they usually buy more ships to grow and scale. So when the number of ships in the market gets too high again, the shipping companies are unable to demand higher prices and they lose money. So this vicious cycle seems to happen quite often in the shipping industry. Another thing to consider is the price of steel. When steel prices are high, shipping companies are more likely to scrap old ships. When steel prices are low, shipping companies are more likely to buy new ships. You want to buy stock in shipping companies when there are less ships in the market. That's the bottom line. And you want to sell your shipping stocks when the market has too many ships. One way to gauge the profitability of this company is to track the Baltic Dry Index. That's an index of average prices paid for the transport of dry bulk materials across more than 20 routes. This index reflects the supply and demand for the industry. And if you look at that index in 2007 and 2008, it was really high. And shipping companies were charging so much money to ship products. And they were making money hand over fist. Let's take a look at their 930 financials. We'll start off with their income statement. This shows us the trailing nine months for 2023 and 2022 the third quarter of 2023, the third quarter of 2022, and all of 2022. So this most recent quarter, revenue is 1.3 billion, down from 3.2 billion. And for the trailing nine months, it's 4 billion. When you look at 2022, 10.4 billion. So revenue is down a lot. But you may think 1.3 billion of revenue is good. It would be good if their expenses weren't so high. You can see they have a gross loss of 2.2 billion. So that's revenue minus the expenses directly tied to generating the revenue, which are 1 billion, 400 million of depreciation, and 2 billion of impairments. So actually it's not that bad because you should really ignore the impairments. That's a one-time item. Depreciation is recurring, but that's a non-cash item. So if you take those two numbers out, they do have a gross profit. It'd be around 270 million. So we'll give them margins of about 24% or so, which isn't terrible. But if you look at last year, they had margins of 50% when you include the depreciation. So their margins have gone down a lot, which is what you would expect because when revenue goes down, so do margins. Then they have other expenses like GNA, 64 million, operating expenses, 22 million. It looks like they finance vessels, 101 million. So they do have a big net loss. But it's not really that bad because you shouldn't count the impairments. So if you want to get a clear picture on how much cash they generate or lose, we could look at the statement of cash flows. In the current quarter, they had a net loss of $2.3 billion. In the third quarter of 2022, they had a net gain of $1.2 billion. But when you look at the cash flow in the current quarter, it's $337 million. Last year it was $1.7 billion. So they didn't lose any cash flow, even though they reported a big net loss. Because when you calculate operating cash flow, you add back the impairment and you add back depreciation. Those are non-cash items. There are other adjustments as well. Like when you buy product on credit, that's when you use accounts payable and you have a cash inflow. But last year, 
they paid back a lot of accounts payable. So they had a cash outflow of $194 million. Also last year, they paid a lot in income taxes, $343 million. This year, only $3.3 million because they weren't as profitable. They didn't spend much in their investing section. They had a cash outflow of $9 million. Most of that was from acquisition. Acquisition of tangible assets and acquisition of investment instruments. About $50 million. Last year, they spent over $800 million. In their financing section, they paid back $350 million of debt. Last year, they paid back $430 million. In this quarter, they did not pay a dividend. They didn't have enough money. Last year, they paid $570 million in dividends. Let's look at their balance sheet. A company like this has lots of fixed assets, the vessels, $3.2 billion. That's the value of the vessels on the balance sheet. It's the original value minus what they depreciated. Last year was $4.6 billion. So they either sold some vessels or depreciated them a lot or a combination. Then you have the containers, those big shipping containers, those 20 foot by 20 foot boxes. That's how they hold product. The value of that is nearly $800 million. They have other investments of $1.3 billion. This might be investments in other companies or investments in bonds. They list their non-current assets first. Non-U.S. companies list non-current than current. U.S. companies list current than non-current. Their current assets are $2.6 billion. Current liability is $2.5 billion. So their current ratio is slightly above 1. Their total assets are down a lot. It was $12 billion. Now it's $8 billion. They are a profitable company, but their equity has gone down. Last year it was $5.8 billion, now it's $2.6 billion. Because they paid so much in dividends. Retain earnings is a sum of all your prior net incomes minus the dividends you paid out. If they didn't pay out so much in dividends, their retained earnings wouldn't have went down that much. They lease their vessels, so they have $3 billion in lease payments which is a little less than the value of the vessels, because remember the value is up here, 3.2 billion. And these are non-current liabilities, so their lease payments due beyond one year. They owe 1.7 billion within one year. So that's about 4.7 billion of lease payments. And the vessels are only worth 3.2 billion. So their total liability is 5.6 billion down from 6.2 billion. Let's take a look at the company on Simply Wall Street. It's last price 964, 1.2 billion market cap. Up a whopping 31% in the past week, down 45% in the past year. Let's learn a little more about the company. Zim provides container shipping and related services in Israel and internationally. They provide door-to-door -door and port-to-port -port transportation services for various types of customers, including end-users, consolidators, and freight forwarders. They also offer Zim Monitor, a premium reefer cargo tracking service. That doesn't mean marijuana shipping. That's a term they use. It's refrigerated cargo containers. Reefer cargo. As of December 2022, they had 150 vessels which included 139 container vessels and 11 vehicle transport vessels. Nine of those vessels were owned by the company. 141 are chartered in and a network of 67 weekly lines. They started in 1945, headquartered in Haifa, Israel. They IPO'd back in the beginning of 2021 and the stock exploded right off the bat. It went from $7 to $88 at its peak. So in just 13 months, the stock went up over a thousand percent. And of course, lots of people bought the stock thinking it's going to go even higher. And it came down to 50. Then there was a little run up to 70, came down to 44, another little run up to 52. But really since that point, it's just been coming down. So why did people lose faith in this company? I have seen comments where people say this is a scam company. Maybe it is. Maybe that's why no one wants a stock anymore. But if it was a scam company, it wouldn't be worth over a billion dollars. But Enron was a scam company and they were worth a lot, probably over a hundred billion. Simply Wall Street's valuation is $80. They say the stock is 88% undervalued. They're even more bullish than me. Seven analysts priced this stock at 743. They say it's overvalued. Here's their revenue since 2012. It was 4 billion. And then it was pretty much flat over the next eight or nine years. It's three and a half billion in 2020. Shipping rates went up a lot and their revenue almost hit 14 billion. It's come down a lot. It's down to six billion, but it's still double 
2020 levels. And the forecast is for their revenue to be pretty much flat over the next couple of years. 5.7 billion is a forecast for 2025. They did have over 2 billion of debt in 2013. And it looks like they use debt sporadically because as you can see, it goes up and down, up and down. But I think when they IPO, they use that money to pay down debt. Their debt is pretty low, only 127 million. And they did have negative equity for several years, but now their equity is pretty strong, but it has come down a lot since the peak. It was almost 6 billion. Now it's two and a half billion. And the green line is their cash. And you can see they have lots of cash on their balance sheet, enough to pay down all their debt. These vertical green lines are their quarterly dividend payments. Look at this huge dividend they paid, $17 in 2022. They had a yield of 60% and they were maintaining that yield for several quarters. Usually that doesn't happen. Usually when a yield is really high, something bad happens. Either the company cuts their dividend, eliminates their dividend, or the stock price gets out of hand. They did do a good job of maintaining the dividend, but they did have to cut it recently. The forecast for 2024 is a 0% dividend and 2025 a 3% dividend, which is a far cry from the 87% dividend in April 2023. But if you bought the stock at IPO, you would have got paid back multiple times in dividend payments. And if you're still holding the stock, there's an opportunity for the stock to go up again or get dividends in the future. Eli Glickman has been CEO for over six years. We don't know how much money he makes. There's no insider trading activity in the past year, at least not according to Simply Wall Street. 60% of the companies held by the general public, 21% by private companies, and 19% by institutions. Their biggest shareholder is Cord Investments. They own 21% of the company. I can't really find too much information about Cord Investments. I'm not sure why they own so much of this company. Then it looks like an Israeli company owns 2.2% of the stock. BlackRock, we all know BlackRock, Citadel, Goldman owns over 1%, Morgan Stanley, Bank of America. So they have pretty decent names that own this stock. So if these big companies own the stock, it's probably a legit company. Schwab, Sculptor, this is an asset manager in New York City, UBS, Numeric Investors, an investment manager in Boston. Their employee count has gone up from 3,800 to 4,800 currently. And the ticker trades in two places, Deutsche Börse and New York Stock Exchange. So let me know what you think. Give the video a like, subscribe, or comment below. If you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.